Now here we are, almost done. Time for the third Avenger, Iron Man, who, despite the fact that he alone has made more money than any other Avenger, he was originally a B-list superhero, so Marvel was really reaching for him on this one, considering that there are multiple other Avengers to choose from. So Iron Man, huh? This is gonna be a fun one. I mean, seriously, think about it. What can he do that actually makes any sense at all? But if we left the video at that, it would be way too short, so let's really get into this. One thing to look at is how much Iron Man's armor actually weighs. I mean, look at this. The fact now that this phenomenon just goes away in other movies like The Avengers make no sense, but we'll try not to think of it too hard. So with the fact that it falls through solid concrete like that, it must weigh a ton, right? I mean, seriously, let's see how much this thing actually weighs. This thing weighs a total whopping 200 pounds. Yep. No, no, it says it only weighs 200 pounds. There's a problem with this. Uh, no, no, it isn't. No, no, it, it really only weighs 200 pounds. I looked it up, yeah. You're kidding me. I'm not. 91 kilograms. Yes. That's what you're telling me. Yes, I am. Falls through solid concrete at 91 kilograms. Yes, it does. Oh, well, fine, wh whatever. This is ridiculous, but I'll buy it. Okay, so apparently it only weighs 200 pounds. Although, that alone makes no sense that he falls through solid concrete. 200 pounds just also doesn't seem like it would defend itself against things like Hulk and Thor's hammer. So, let's see how well it can do against those kind of hits. Though it cannot perform as well in the real world as it does in the comics, there is a possibility that it can still be quite an effective suit. There are really two main materials that he can use to create his armor, and these are carbon composite and what is called crystal titanium. First, let's look at carbon composite. This is almost as strong as steel and weighs one-third the weight and can resist temperatures up to 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,260 degrees Celsius. What is actually the biggest concern of this material is not worrying if it would melt, rather if Tony would. To help me elaborate on this topic, we can take a look at the Concorde, the first plane that was able to break the sound barrier. But a problem with it was that they had to do the equivalent of lining the plane with refrigerators, so unless there is a super cooling component in Iron Man's suit, he can't possibly fly. This may seem ironic, on how Tony was trying to solve the cooling levels in the first movie, now he needs to raise them again. So from what we've seen, Tony's suit could withstand some of this heat, but how about the strength? That's where we need something that is called single crystal titanium. Single crystal is a type of metal in which the crystal lattice of the entire sample is continuous and unbroken to the edges of the sample, with no grain and boundaries. You might be scratching your head wondering what this all means, so since you are probably lost, I'll elaborate a little more. This means that the material is a single structure, like that of a diamond, but a diamond can easily be cut if hit correctly. This cannot. The sole reason of this is that one property of metal is that it does not have a cut line or place that it can be pierced easier than others. So with this super titanium, Tony's suit might be able to withstand some pretty incredible impacts. Though what happens if he is impacted with something? Something that shreds apart his armor. What would he do? It would be near impossible for him to make those nicks and scratches look like new especially with what his suit is made out of. That is where a third material can come in handy. This is called nitinol. This is an alloy between nickel and titanium. This will be very effective because it is durable and extremely light, though there is a very important property of this material at hand here. This is nitinol's self repair feature, and this may sound more like magic than science, but it actually exists. This material has the unique feature that once it has been damaged, it can reach a certain transformation temperature. Once this temperature is reached, it will begin to repair itself and assume its original shape. While this may not be a perfect heal, with some of Tony's techno know-how, he could probably make great use of this. So with the Triforce and materials, the actual Iron Man suit is not all that improbable. The next thing to discuss is his power source. Now it might seem that this arc reactor is impossible, self-powering and all, but it's not actually self-powering, and there is definitely something on Earth that fits the description of this donut of destiny. This was a prototype that was first developed during the Cold War and is called the Tokamak Reactor. It is a plasma-powered electromagnet that runs off positively charged ions to generate and then capture an absurd amount of energy. One small problem with this is that the Tokamak Reactor uses nuclear fusion which in itself may provide too much power to the suit and overheat the entire system. And nuclear fusion can heat things up to the temperature of 150 million degrees Kelvin. And I know you may be asking yourself. That's like 50 times hotter than the temperature of the sun. And that is correct, but the sun's temperature is so low because it has a large mass to contain that energy and amplify it. The arc reactor can fit in the palm of your hand, 
so needless to say, Iron Man's arc reactor would have killed him a long ago, if it was possible. But let's stop talking about the arc reactor, and start talking about the construction of such a reactor in a cave. Now this may seem quite contrary to what normally seems to occur, but Marvel actually paid attention to some of those things and got it right in the Iron Man movie. If you listen closely in the beginning, Tony Stark makes a great big deal of getting palladium from the missiles in the cave when he's building his initial chest-sized arc reactor. This is likely an essential component of the reactor because palladium is one of the few elements theorized to be a potential room temperature superconductor. Modern superconductors have to be kept very cold due to the way electrons flow through metals or semi-metals. Also, when Pepper has to change his new battery, she gets upset because she doesn't like the pus and Tony says that it's inorganic plasmic discharge. This is surprisingly accurate because it is exactly what would be left over on Ms. Suit's power supply. Just because this thing can power this much, theoretically, does not mean that it can. So maybe Tony Stark actually was able to create a smaller and more practical version of this reactor, and he might be able to fully use it as a practical source of power, but that is definitely a debatable issue. Finally, let's look how Iron Man flies by directing his repulsors at the ground at minimal power so he does not fire a plasma bolt. But this makes absolutely no sense from an efficiency perspective. It is much more practical that he would use xenon ion boosters to fly, as these are our boosters which are used on the Voyager spacecraft and other NASA projects. The xenon boosters use electricity to excite xenon particles and have them travel down a structure similar to the barrel of a gun, or in this case, Iron Man's palms. This structure allows the xenon to accelerate to high speeds, but xenon has a lot of inertia to the point where the rate of acceleration produces lift would be quite high, but also very useful. This also makes sense as they run on electricity, so as does everything else in Iron Man's suit. Now there are a lot more things to the great Iron Man, like his repulsor blast is an incredible strength, so we're going to be splitting this episode into two parts, but it'll be a while because I think at the end of all this, we might get a little tired of the Avengers, but it will come. So remember, whether he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a god of thunder or just sitting at the bar doing shots alone, Tony Stark will still never live down the second Iron Man movie. But the first one was great, and he was also good in the Avengers. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and remember to leave a like and comment on what hero you would like to see perform in the real world next. We're the Superhero Scientist, signing off. Tony Stark makes you feel he's a cool exec with a heart of steel. And Iron Man, oh, just the place he's fighting.